Thank you so much, Meg. Thank you, Power to Fly, for inviting us to have this beautiful conversation. Andrea, I'm so excited to be moderating this conversation. The time is going to fly by super quickly, so let's just jump in head first. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that can be. Yes, I love that you are just like pioneering this conversation. So just in advance. Thank you so much. Let us know a little bit more about yourself. I know Meg gave a nice introduction there, but is there anything else you want to share about yourself to kick us off? Oh my goodness. Uh, I am so happy to be here. It's so awesome to be speaking with so many um, people, especially, you know, being a queer woman of color, but also working in the field of like sexuality. It's just such a, um, it's such a great thing. I used to build accounting software. I started my career in accounting software like 11 years ago, which is really different. Um, And I think it's so important today more than ever to be bringing sex education in because there's so many things changing in this world for the better and um, all generations, not just Gen Z and young people, but people of all ages, we're meeting people who are um, getting liberated and learning and, you know, redefining what it means to be human and all the different expressions of gender, sexuality, and so many things. So I just feel really grateful to be able to be in that intersection. Yes, and we're grateful to have you uh, share and drop knowledge. Uh, I want to make sure that I know we got a lot of folks listening. So I want to just throw the reminder out there for our live callers uh, who are joining this conversation. If you have any questions or reflections or tips and tricks of your own that you want to share, please drop that in the chat box and I will flag that to our guest speaker so we can try to get to those before uh, the end of the conversation. But until then, I'm going to go with some of these questions you all have submitted previously. Um, So Andrea, tell us a little bit more about your journey uh, growing up. Um, I read from your website that you came from a more conservative family. Um, I'm sure we're all curious what led you uh, to, you know, where you are today. So I um, grew up in a very traditional, religious, Catholic, Filipino, uh, American home. Both my parents grew up in the Philippines. And growing up, we did not talk about sex at all. I pretty much got the, you know, public school you'll don't, don't get it, you know, don't die or get pregnant or this like bear based shame based education at home. It was a lot of that same thing. Like do not have sex until you're married. And that had a huge impact on me. I, uh, early in my life pretty much decided that sexuality was not a thing that I could learn about or know about. And so for me, it was all channeled into school and work. And so I, I started, you know, in tech, um, pretty young. I, went right away, right out of college, um, started building accounting software with another woman, Jessica Ma and our friend, Andy Sue. And um, we built B2B accounting software. And that's how I got into tech. Another woman pretty much called me out of my linguistics path, which I was originally on. I had no plans to be in tech. And from there, you know, worked in venture capital. And throughout that whole time, you know, on the outside, I look like I'm just you know, so on top of things, but personally, I was really struggling with sexuality myself. I was coming out of the closet finally in my mid twenties. And, um, it was ironic because in my daytime, I was helping invest in internet companies. I had built internet companies, but in terms of learning about sex and getting resources about, you know, learning about sexuality, there was very little online that I was feel like was helping me. It was like Planned Parenthood, or like Pornhub. It was like, that was what I felt like it was. And I would go around to people and I'd be like, why is it like this? And of course, you know, I was, I was working in venture capital at the time and people were like, oh, we don't, we don't do that. That's like, that's like drugs. And I'm like, no, it's not like at all. Um, And so that's what started it. I, I started to really get obsessed with what could exist in the middle of those two things and what how could we solve this information asymmetry problem on the internet like you can learn about anything on the internet but I felt like there was so much misinformation and just you know it wasn't easy uh to get that information at the time and so that's what started the journey about now like five years ago Brilliant. And I love that you made a big and beautiful career pivot. Uh, I would love to hear more about that a little later. But I just I'm, I'm interested because I love speaking about ways that we can decolonize the mind. And of course, sexuality has everything, almost everything to do with that. Um, I love speaking about the importance of emotional intelligence at home and in the workplace. And I find that, you know, um, this, uh, as you said before, some of the former, you know, 
folks who are interested in, in not investing, they were basically calling this a taboo, which is one of the most natural things uh, that can happen. I mean, we're here because, you know, people got together and created us, we can say to one extent, right? So it's interesting that this is a taboo, a taboo topic to talk about. So let's just speak a little bit to the business part of things. So when you were starting this, knowing that this, you know, the, the mainstream public at least would see this as a taboo, how did you start to find, you know, what were your first steps? How did you start to find funding and people to, you know, vouch for you? Can you speak a little bit more, more about, you know, mentorships and things like that? Anything you want to tap into now, but just, I find that more folks are, are less likely to approach a taboo area because, you know, they are fear, they are fearful of finding supporters, maybe people that don't look like them that, you know, they have to trust to basically give their whole idea away and, and they don't necessarily even trust in the topic. I know you have a lot to say, so go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, it was met with just a lot of that's not how we do things. And someone would might call it gaslighting because they were like, this is so niche. And I, like you, like I remember um, this person had like one of the people who founded Twitch actually like I, I was meeting this person and they were like, oh, uh, like just offhand, like mentioned that what I was doing was niche. And I was like, y'all sold the company to Amazon, which is like people watching other people play video games. Like don't fucking call what I do niche, you know, <laughs> like that, that I, I just was very sensitive to this that and it was really so recently that we even got things like a breast pump and so I thought I saw VC moving and it has moved a lot even in like the five years I've been doing it but in the beginning it was like groundbreaking to do menstruation fertility like reproductive tech so it's basically hands mates tale like anything that like would make a baby was starting to be okay and like why the fuck didn't we have a breast pump too I'm like that you know that should be okay so venture was so late you know it's different it's you know why we're all here right it was a lack of people who had lived experiences and when it came to sex there was this oh that'll make money but you got to go get funded by the porn people like it was like there was this belief that everything on the internet that had anything to do with sex would devolve into porn And this is not completely out of the question because much of online internet technology tech like has been driven by the adult industry. And I think we don't give the adult industry enough credit. Like it's kind of thrown away and there's a million problems we could talk about with it, but you can't deny that the reason we have online video streaming, online payments, like all of these huge trillion dollar spaces were driven by people wanting to see other people naked on the internet. And that's okay. Like, I am not here to be, you know, there's a lot of problems with porn, but there's also so much of our, like, you know, our thinking around the space is encouched in fear. And, you know, I'm, I just gave a talk a few weeks ago um, about sexting and sending nudes and every generation is, is grappling with new challenges. And the issue is not, let's stop this thing. Let's stop kids from sexting. Let's stop kids from, you know, doing something on Snapchat or whatever it is. The issue is we don't talk about sex as a society. And that includes investors. Investors are just as repressed and have problems uh, like as anyone else. And that's not a bad thing. I also grew up repressed and struggling. And so when I first started going out there, it was just starting to do that. Like I started, I tried to invest in companies. I looked into working at companies and I think anyone who's trying to get into a space, like you need a healthy amount of arrogance to be a founder. And I am not like apart from that, like you need a healthy amount of arrogance, but I do think that you get to healthy arrogance, have having really spoken to the best people you can find in this space to really ask questions and not have the opinion like, oh, well, it's going to be, you know, we just have to do something and it's going to work. Like the reason things don't happen or that you don't see the things you want to see is because usually the problems are huge and really smart people before you tried to solve them. And so you called me a pioneer. There were so many pioneers before me that tried. And then there's certain things, you know, that open up or change um, in my life, you know, even in the five years I have seen trans, you know, awareness and people wanting to learn about asexuality and people wanting to learn about like different bodies just, and you know, this is a, this is a movement. This is not just one company. And I think always, like, I don't think I had that humility that I needed when I started the company. And so, um, in the beginning, I just dove in and tried stuff pretty much. I started building stuff on the weekend. I didn't quit my day job. I think as a first generation, like I did not grow up with money. Um, class was a bigger thing for me than even my sexual orientation or my gender. I feel like it was like, I 
don't come from money at all. And so I did not quit my day job when I started the company. I hustled, side hustled, you know, kept my day job as long as possible until, you know, my fund actually pushed me out the door with some funding because they saw like, oh, yeah, she's, she's going to keep bugging us about investing in this space. So we're just going to like kick her out. So she can, I'm just kidding. They really were pivotal for me, but that was after seven years working in tech. And so I always tell people too, like, it wasn't like I had a great idea and then people funded my idea. You know, you invest so many years of your life in people around you knowing who you are. And there's circles of privilege that I had to unlock because again, I don't come from capital in any way. It was just how I built my career. And when I started to actually build O School, we went through so many different iterations. We started off as live streaming, we moved on, that did not work. And then, you know, we saw that, wow, there's just like this information asymmetry problem. Let's make content and learn about the marketing challenges because sexual wellness to get to the world is, is really a marketing challenge at its heart. And so that's a long way of saying it was hard. Um, it's hard for everybody though. Like I think when people look at like, oh, it must be so, you know, difficult in femtech and sex tech. And it is, there are challenges that other spaces don't face. And also none of us in us, the space, you can't tell us that what we're doing is not important, real, like we, people will try, but when you work day to day in like, like what you talked about, like that emotional tone, that real like core of someone, like we as a society are confronting race, like really confronting racism and all of our, is like all of the sexism, misogyny, like, and we're bringing it to the service. There's a lot of trauma that's coming to the service. There's a lot of people who for the first time in their life are feeling safe enough to like be who they are. And I see um, a really huge shift coming in that acceptance that what we grew up with what we think is the way things are, aren't happening. I see this generationally happening across, like even the femtech leaders are grappling with how to, you know, it's not a, it's, you know, what is, what is the tagline? Like the future is female. It's like, no, the future is actually like super non-binary and like, you know, bisexual and queer and like, you know, and I, but I also don't feel like we need to throw away those people because they were really fighting for, you know, they really were fighting in open doors. Like I'm here because people before me were fighting for breast pumps and fertility. And yes, like, I think they need to move and we need to like move past this like futurist female discussion. Yet I don't think that those people should be, you know, left behind because we're here because of them. And just real, like, that's like what I'm fighting for is like, we all didn't get it right at one point. I didn't, I I know that for me, I fell in love with a trans person and that's how I got, you know, called in to learning about how to be, you know, a better human being and more inclusive there. And I want to extend that grace to people who didn't have the education or the exposure because I went to a super progressive university and I still didn't get that. And that's, I think where the emotional intelligence and bridging, um, and where O school sits in the world is, is that we got to have places where it's okay to not know things. Yes, so much to crack open there, but we don't have so much time now. I would love to also just side note, I want to have you back to like dive in deeper here. Um, You've talked about so much that I can, I just need to catch my breath a little bit. Um, One of the things that really sparks my interest is um, I love speaking about just bringing more awareness to the fact that the digital space is being colonized and just hold for a pause hold for a pause there so people really take that in the digital space is being colonized and just to bring up some you know really simple examples you know who are the who are the majority building tech and I'm sure you had you you know you had that face-to-face uh uh intimacy uh with it when you you know transitioned you could you could see the majority of folks building tech you know came from a certain privilege came from a certain you know race gender uh, and now you're opening doors and I love that you're speaking about you know sending the elevator back down leaving the door open this advocacy that needs to continue to happen can you speak a little bit more about uh O School's mission where do you see O School you know in five ten years what are your what are your hopes so that we can you know start to support that and and support the work that you're doing yeah again I see a solving an information asymmetry problem what people google and what comes up in google matters and it's a very technical and tough problem to solve that and so if o school solve that in 5 years and like 100 million people are looking up stuff and getting really non-judgmental science-based 
information about sex, then like, I'm really happy. That's a really, it's a hard and important and non-trivial problem. A, we don't have a lot of research about sex. Sex is not really well researched. It, it's so systemic. It goes all the way down. Like you want to make a WebMD or a health line of sex. Well, you need good research. Good research comes from, you know, so the academic, the social, the political, the policy, like it's, I think like when you're solving a huge problem, like, I think it's harder than going to the moon. I'm going to say that. Like, I think what Elon Musk is doing is like fundamentally not as hard as like the things that many people on this platform are doing, which is trying to get humans to, you know, be liberated. <laughs> and like yes. you said, digital spaces are colonized. What, what matters to the people building internet spaces? So I was once in a room with a lot of like, just like white men building tech circles. Again, I, I swim in the poison of like white patriarchy, capitalist spaces all the time because that's what we need. I think the revolution is going to need some capital <laughs> and like, I hope to be able to contribute in whatever way I can. And the thing that's amazing is like the things that they inherently, the things that many of the men in the space that I've, for example, like overwhelmingly more interested in things like immortality and like going to space. And like, I speak to a lot of people of color entrepreneurs and we're just like, nah, like I want this like, planet, but like less poverty. How about like, no, like less violence toward everybody of color of like, you know, all of these issues are deeply like what gets us into tech is the ability to change those things. And what gets other people in the tech may not match. And I'm not trying to like point fingers, everyone's unique, but it's it's pretty like clear to me that many of the people who are furthering a lot of the deepest technology backed by the, the capital, they have interests that may not be what, if we all voted <laughs> about what this utopia future looks like, we won't agree. And I do see myself staking like team human on O school. Like we're for a future where every single human being is given the access to the resources to be able to choose the sexuality that is right for them, whether that's no sex, all the sex, queer sex, kinky sex, like, a, you know, that, that asexual life, whatever it is, like, that's, I think, very important because so much of the issues with society is, you know, we're, we're told there's only a few paths that are, you know, that are okay. And that's been, that's a colonized, like you said, like that's, we get that from a lot of the internet and, I don't think in my lifetime that governments are going to be treating, teaching about orgasms and how to get more pleasure. I don't even really want that. Like, I don't, you know, I really look at like, what's the future? Like, will we, will pleasure be taught in schools? Like, I don't know. I don't know if that's the case. And so the internet is one of the most important places that we need to like resist the colonizers. If you know what I mean? Like we have to, we have to take up space on the internet or else, you know, I, I think people ask like, why didn't I make a school nonprofit? That's a really common question I get. And I'm like, cause I don't want Bezos to freaking take over this space. <laughs> like I feel a moral imperative not to let other people win this digital space. Yes. Say that again. You said <laughs> something earlier. <laughs> yep. Let's put that on a t-shirt and just put it out, <laughs> print it out in masses, you know, um, consent, the word consent comes up and something that I really appreciate in, in queer spaces and new tech queer spaces that consent is at the top. You know, you have to be involved uh, in saying, in giving permission, yes or no, and respecting the no. Um, and just to kind of build a bridge, you were, you were, you have a lot to say about Elon Musk and I, I would love to chat with you offline more about that. But he didn't ask me if I wanted to see a bunch of satellites in the air. I'm in Patagonia. And at night, I have the most beautiful uh, view of the, of the night sky of the stars. And all of a sudden, I see all these satellites. I'm like, who is this coming? And just uh, who is like, you know, claiming territory of, of this beautiful piece of sky? You didn't ask me. <laughs> right. um, that's a whole nother topic. But uh, this actually is a good segue into, you know, can you speak a little bit more to how you keep the space safe. You did speak about, you know, being able to express yourself, um, being able to, you know, give consent and all that. How, how do you create that safe space online? Um, because I feel like we need more models of that. You know, there are people that you say, mm -hmm. no, it's not, or it's either, you know, hardcore porn or it's not happening, but there has to be a happy medium. Right. Right. Um, well, I don't do create you... community spaces anymore, but you can see this on Reddit, YouTube, like there are, there are 
there arguably are no safe spaces on the internet for queer LGBTQIA like less people. Like you can, and I think there's been data to show this and just recent studies that have shown this. And so I'm not claiming that we create an information resource. So there's very, you know, there's the interaction is not necessarily happening, but we are the beacon of like, hey, we've done the science review. We we have a, a space that we hold, you know, trying not to ever judge or shame people. And I think that's important. And for us, like we serve people, you know, all ages to 80 years old, you know, a lot of the spectrum of age, we serve people in a hundred countries. And so what's okay in one place is not the same in other. And it's, we don't always get it right because it's impossible to have some, you know, it's like not even one of our goals to make something that is, you know, acceptable to every human on this planet, because that's, I think, not the case. We're trying to champion that it's okay to be sexual. It's okay not to be sexual. And we're trying to put the best research and science that we know out there. And that's what we, that's the lane we sit in. In terms of people creating safe spaces, dating apps have this problem, online forums. And I feel for them because it is so hard. At one point we had live streaming as an aspect. It took so much time for us to have moderators making sure that, you know, you're on it when harmful comments get made, but you also want to have spaces to call in because maybe a comment was made because someone didn't get access to education. And so it's not, there are no like easy villains, easy heroes. And whenever it's made that way, I see a big problem because we, society set up a lot of people to fail in terms of not teaching them consent. We have a sex ed you know, program and we don't have sex ed in half the schools in the country, but even the ones that do, you, you know, if you see a consent program, that's a very lucky community that has that because we don't teach consent. And so we, we really judge people for not knowing this thing that we don't as a society teach. And I see a huge problem with that. And so creating more access to resources is important because, you know, when people, my Angelou always come back, when people know better, they do better. And until we get people to know better, I don't think they're going to do better because this is, this is uh, something that goes way beyond um, our generation. This has been like generationally passed down <laughs> uh, in a lot of ways, these, these ideas of who gets to touch who and for what reason, who gets to own someone's likeness and for what reason. This connects to the tech, you know, bubble. Like there's this who gets to decide, who gets to draw the lines, right? And I think it's so important for us as, you know, for, for, for us as a community of people who care about diversity, who care about inclusion, who care about, you know, queer and so many different marginalized communities to really take up space here. Because if not, like, I don't, I'm not gonna assume that the people in the most powerful positions are going to look out for our interests. Um, and so it's like, going back to creating safer spaces, it's like being in leadership positions and speaking up. It's not, you can't guarantee a safe space. I'm sad to say that, but it's like, there are no complete safe spaces in, in the real world on the street. Like there, you know, arguably if you're, um, you know, people know this, like there are unsafe spaces mostly in, in like our real world and online, it's the same. It's probably worse. I would say it's probably less safe online. And so, you know, you don't go to the comments at YouTube, you know, you just know if you're a queer person, if you're a woman, if you're a black person, you don't speak up on, on these platforms because the violence that will come to you. And again, this could have been solved with leadership on these spaces. I don't think it would have been easy. I don't think it would technically maybe never would have been fully solved, but it wouldn't be the situation it is now where it is a just abuse bloodbath sometimes on these platforms. And I do believe that many people on these platforms cared. I don't like the branding because I've, I've been in these companies. You do meet the people championing, you know, uh, less harassment, for example, at Twitter, but it, it comes from the leadership. It comes from the top, like the DNA of companies is formed long ago. And even if they care, you know, I know for a fact that the Instagram founders like want nipples, like the free to nipple was a huge thing. And I spoke to one of the co-founders of Instagram and he was like, I wish we could do nipples, but it's actually, you know, what this other boss we have or LPs or investors or the Apple, you know, the app store, there's so many systemic reasons that prevent people from doing the right things, even when they want to. And I just like want to say that because I think like, it's not just, they're just evil and they just want to sit and be evil. We're in a system where it's really tough sometimes to not do the thing that, you know, makes the most money or like pleases the most people and breaking through that, it's going to take a lot of power and capital for us as a community.
Yes, and, and more emotional intelligence. I want to throw that in there too, because without when you have a bunch of power and capital, with, without the empathy, without the self awareness, I mean, who knows what can happen? So I love that you're you're totally speaking to developing our emotional intelligence so that we can be more mindful uh, and you know have a, a higher caliber, a more holistic uh, space to be able to be ourselves. So time has flown. We are actually at our time, but I do want to ask you one more question. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice. What piece of advice would you would you give yourself? I would have told myself. I really would have of slowed down in some areas myself, like I would give myself the same advice I wish other tech founders of large platforms way bigger than mine um, would take, which is this work is not venture capital is is not the pace of the world. I follow a lot of in, indigenous ancestral wisdom and rapid, rapid growth. Like the only thing in nature that I really see that grows that fast is like cancer, you know, and viruses. And I know that might be too on the nose considering the couple of years we've had, but like real long-term change takes time. And I aligned a lot of what I do with models that really value hyper growth over everything. And, you know, now I'm grateful in some ways that I did those things. And I've learned a lot. And also um, I know that I'm trying to model a growth that more matches what I see in nature and what I'm taught by like trees and birds and, and indigenous people. Absolutely. I love that. And I want to connect with you offline because I feel like we gel on a lot of things. Um, but uh, unfortunately, our time is out. So can you remind folks how they can connect with you when we uh, when we finish the conversation in 30 seconds? Let us know how to connect with you online, social medias, emails, whatever you, information you want to give. Great. And thank you so much, Andrea, for, for taking the time to speak up today. I really appreciate you. Yeah, I'm on Twitter at A Barica. Um, on Instagram, I'm not active for mental health reasons. Andrea Barica there. She divest from those platforms if it's good for you, for sure. Um, but, uh, I'm my, my company as O dot school, O D O T school on the platforms and yeah, please, uh, LinkedIn, anything like that. I love actually like LinkedIn's the shit for me right now, which makes me sound like a super nerd, but I'm like, that's where my mental health is right now. So yeah, get at me on LinkedIn. Um, Andrea Barica, look forward to connecting with all of you and Mariella, it's totally mutual. It was a pleasure.